Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, brace yourselves for more systems work here. Um, <laughs> so just to recap one more time, uh, if you want to get started on some install, there's not going to be too much. Um, but you can go to github.com slash city of Austin slash school of data. We have instructions for how to get started there. Um, but we're going to talk for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then we're going to get into hands-on stuff. We're going to do back-end uh, Python ETL, and then we're going to do some front-end JavaScript and React. Uh, yeah, and we're talking today about databases, dashboards, and death to paper, which is something we take a lot of pride in doing. Um, so my name is John Clary. I'm from the City of Austin Transportation Department. I manage our data and technology services team. Uh, we're a shared services team that serves 300 people in our transportation department. Um, and I'm here with Matteo Clark, who's our senior software developer, uh, full stack developer. Matteo has a background in civic tech and has also worked at a startup. Um, so yeah, we want this to be interactive. Feel free to just jump in, ask questions, slow us down, whatever. But um, we're going to be try, try and be gentle for all the folks who are fairly new to this kind of programming. <clears throat> So that was Howdy. Um, and so we're going to you know, talk for the next 30 minutes about our team, a little bit about what smart city means to us, because that's a word that we have to deal with pretty often. Um, our software and platform choices we will go into our systems architecture and show you some projects to illustrate the, the architecture choices that we're making. And then we'll get into the hands-on stuff. Um, a, little about, a little bit about our team. Uh, in case this interests you, so the transportation department in the city of Austin is managing all of the traffic and pedestrian signals across the city. We issue uh, parking permits, right-of-way permits, and we also manage the scooters that have descended upon our city as well. <clears throat> uh, we, all of the street designers and transportation engineers are in our department. We install street signs and manage all the pavement markings and probably a bunch of other stuff too. Um, picture of our transportation management center. So we have staff who are um, from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. monitoring traffic conditions across the city. They can change traffic signal timing remotely as needed. Uh, we have a fiber cable network that's connecting all of our signals to their centra central operations. Uh, so quite a bit of tech in the department. Um, what our team does is we're really focused on using technology to solve real problems. Uh, for real people related to mobility in Austin. So we, you know, we publish a lot of data that's authoritative and reliable. We support real-time performance measurement. Uh, we're really interested in empowering our staff to find the information they need quickly and easily. And we're trying to position ourselves in the department to adopt new technology quickly. We are a staff of nine right now, and that's it's a mix of systems analysts and a developer and some GIS analysts. And we'll be adding three more this year, so we're excited to be up to 12. And we still feel like that's not nearly enough. I don't know if that sounds like a, a large number or a small number to y'all. Things that we do, so we, you know, we, do, we do a lot of the geospatial print maps, web maps, the spatial analysis stuff. We do application support for all of our enterprise systems, app configuration. We do you know, business process refinement, data design and creation. And we have our kind of infrastructure and engineering stuff that we're working on. So desktop and hardware support, systems integration, the data engineering, uh, procurement. And then we also serve as kind of like a professional services group as well. So we're helping manage projects, consulting with our staff on you know so best solutions to fit their needs doing acceptance testing and reporting and it's really open to it's really important to us that we be as open as possible all the time right um this is our one of our cool magnets that our open data team created for the city um and we really do think that we do our best work when we work openly and we we try hard to kind of evangelize that as much as we can in the city and in central texas One of the things that um, kind of throws a wrench in our plans and what we want to be working on a lot of the time is pressure to be a smart city, um, whatever that means. 
And the question we get a lot is, you know, do, what are you doing with big data? What are you doing to be a smarter city? And we're forced to sit through presentations about things like smart pavement, where someone had the excellent idea to put internet into the ground, um, which is fine and maybe a good idea, uh, but the reality is a, a lot of times our back office is, looks like this, right? And we're a really long ways from being interested or um, reasonable to prioritize something like smart city tech when we just need to get folks off of paper. Uh, so this is a, a real traffic signal technician work ticket uh, from 2017. These are no longer in use, praise the Lord. Um, but we were having technicians go out to traffic signal, repair it, write down everything they did at the signal, including the weather. That would get scanned and then archived on a network drive, never to be seen again until there was a public information request, right? Okay. Uh, right, so paper traffic signal work orders in the year 2017 in the city of Austin, Texas. Um, something else that we face a lot are nightmare spreadsheets. This is the dreaded color-coded spreadsheet. Have you ever tried to sort one of these? Uh, um, and then there's always the four copies of that spreadsheet that are mysteriously 120 megabytes in size for like a thousand rows of data. Uh, this is you know, this is like the real problem stuff for us. And a lot of times it's back office or it's working really on the enterprise rather than uh, the sexy public facing stuff. Um, but this is certainly um, what really drives us in our work. And, you know, our mantra really is using technology to solve real problems. Yeah. We use our mic. Thank you. Uh, how much pushback do you get from adoption? Because um That's we it, yeah adoption is a challenge yeah, and you mean getting people to change from paper to a business system or something like that um we you know we try and be gentle and we try and provide them with alternatives that are easy to use um but you know sometimes it does take a mandate from your executives to say that this is the way now uh and we've seen spreadsheets come back to life zombie spreadsheets are a real thing you think they're gone and then you find one on someone's desktop right <laughs> Um, so it's, it's a struggle for sure. Can I just follow that up really quickly? Yeah. Um, just in the work I've done previously and where I am now, I think, you know, when you were talking about pushback, a lot of that is less about like a new process and more about a cultural shift within the organization frequently. And that's gotta be like a much softer and I think like inclusive process. And that's when I think you see like whatever new process that's being introduced, like really yeah. Be effective but if you approach it as like here's your new way of entering data it almost always falls flat in its face so the zombie spreadsheets and mm -hmm. and and it's it's hard because you have to get leadership involved so yeah um and you know a lot of times people are i mean they're in pain right the process is really broken and time consuming and they spend a lot of their time doing redundant tasks and so if you're able to free some of their time up they can be really grateful and happy about it um, Uh, we kind of reference this maturity map as a like a heuristic to kind of see where we're at and where we're going. Um, I'll zoom in on just the technology part of it, uh, but just thinking, you know, in terms of long term goals, obviously just taking the paper trail and really turning that into a little bit of automation. Maybe if there's a database that you're putting in the process and then eventually really starting to tie systems together, you know, having a single source of truth for data that can be kind of federated across the organization. Uh, so there are certain parts of our business where we're, we've got this pretty well locked down, and then there are still other, part, other parts of the department where folks are using paper, right? Uh, so it's, it's just an ongoing effort. Uh, all right, I'll let Mateo talk about how we do our work. And so another aspect of what we're trying to introduce when it comes to culture and just the way we operate and processes for our team is um, kind of from the gospel of Leah that you heard. Um, yesterday over lunch and having these iter iterative cycles of development, testing, and so a big part of that for us is sprint reviews. So um, a lot of our projects, we assign a sprint cycle, how long we're going to be working on certain tasks, um, and then at the end of it, we get our stakeholders in the room, we show them what we've done and the progress we've made, we ask for their feedback, um, we ask them to be honest with us, and this really helps us be accountable to the to the work that we've committed to do um, and so that stakeholders see how quickly things are moving forward and understand why they're not um, or you know sometimes they're surprised and happy that things have moved so quickly um, 
It also helps us have a better end product because we're getting frequent check-ins on if we're on the right track or not. <clears throat> and I think kind of most importantly for me as a team member, um, I think it really helps us grow as, as individuals because we get to um, reflect on the work we're doing, um, just, you know, have help seeing if things are, are working well or not and where we need to change. Um, so I think it really, on like a professional development level, it helps us kind of see where we can be improving and also get um, positive support when we're doing a good job. Um, and so you've probably seen diagrams like this. This is basically what we're trying to communicate. You know, we're working with with engineers who are really used to a waterfall type of methodology of scoping everything up um, out, out front and then executing little by little and then delivering at the end. And we're really trying to show them that the way that we would like to operate is a little different where we do more frequent check-ins and you see um, those outcomes little by little over time instead of all at once at the end. And so it's just a cycle of, of designing, implementing, getting feedback with our users and testing, and then doing it all over again. Um, and so now we're gonna kind of shift um, away from who we are and uh, you know some of the processes, but talk about some of the specific software choices or kind of the, um, I guess, bigger, um, yeah, what, what, what's motive, what are the things that we consider when, when choosing platforms? Um, so just like to back up a little bit, um, we, our team is, embedded inside the, the transportation department, um, but there's also a central central IT team. Kind of sounds like uh, ISD is the equivalent here in, in the city of Los Angeles. Um, so County of LA, okay, thank you. Um, and in Austin, we have an acronym CTM, Communications and Technology Management. They're our centralized IT group. Um, and they do a lot of things really well. They um, set up your phone on your first day. They provide all the teleconferencing platforms and Cisco links. Um, email, you know, all the standard kind of things you need to do to get your do job done. They also do a good job of training and they also house kind of like the open data um, program or initiatives um, and they really kind of act as a convening force for all the departments that are doing that kind of work. But there's a lot of things that they don't really do great, um, that they don't really specialize in. And a lot of those things, um, it's not their fault. It's because it's really specific to our department um, and really specific to domain um, domain within, you know, um, managing out the, the traffic infrastructure, um, which we just don't expect them to have a lot of expertise around, or because it's something we need done quickly. Um, and getting them to put together a team to prioritize our work is, um, always takes a long time. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of things that we end up taking on ourselves, and that's kind of why the, our team exists. Um, a lot of it's around moving data around, um, building custom reports for, for different managers um, and executives. Um, more recently, a lot of custom software development and web development. Um, and then, you know, kind of getting back to those agile sprint cycles, doing our own project management, our own user research, and really understanding the needs of our, our users. So um, being kind of this autonomous rogue IT group outside of central IT, we have a lot of freedom to make choices about what we're going to use. Um, and we think about um, open source. A lot of the decision we make, like John said when he introduced me, you know, I came from a background. I got into coding through Open Austin, which is our Code for America brigade. And I showed up enough, and they eventually said, hey, why don't you lead this thing? So I did that for a few years, and I liked it so much that I joined government. Um, and so a lot of where I come from is like, oh, let's, Let's, you know, Google what's a cool package, install it, play with it, okay, and keep moving forward in that way, instead of being like assigned a big task or a big platform and um, trying to understand how it works. From it. So it's a lot of kind of bottom, bottom up decision making instead of being assigned big platforms. Um, and that gets us pretty far because um, with a little bit of coding and with a little bit of Googling and without spending much money, um, aside from hiring some developers, we're, we're able to um, build some things that uh, a lot of times with the out of, out of the box software, you're kind of boxed in and it's hard to, to, to deliver what you really want to. And we really try to avoid spending a bunch of money on enterprise license. Um, a lot of times that's, that's not possible. Um, and a lot of times there's really great vendor tools that we just have to rely on. Um, and we're gonna talk about one, specifically, one specific one that we like, um, that we've been using, um, but we try, to, we try to minimize, you know, our dependence on, on big enterprise platforms. Yeah. Will you uh, turn on your mic? Oh, yeah. 
for the for the web. Yeah. People. Um, so my question is, you know, you talked about you know keeping this agile, making it accessible to staff members, and if they want to try out something new, like a different package or platform or methodology, they can just download it, play with it, figure it out. Um, how do you put you? You said you're outside of your IT system. How do you push back against sort of like the group policy, like you can't install anything. We don't want to open up our system to risk. Um, sort of what were the arguments you yeah. made, you know, kind of going to a different group and like, you know, way up the way up the ladder um, to sort of get that in place? Yeah, we, we didn't go that far up the ladder. Um, we, you know, we, um, we share as little as we have to with corporate IT in terms of what we need. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, you know, it, it's not a hostile relationship, but we feel strongly that it's our business. Um, and if we have a business need, we're justified in kind of pursuing it. Um, and so we put a lot of trust in our staff to make smart decisions and we train them up on what's safe and what's not. Um, but you know, a lot of what we're doing is leveraging infrastructure that's outside the city network entirely, right? So we'll, we'll put stuff on AWS, um, we'll host code on our public GitHub. Um, so we're, our touch points with corporate IT are are as few as possible, really, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I don't feel like I've ever been called out and pointed towards a policy. Um, and maybe it's just because we're kind of flying under the radar and it's kind of this sweet spot that we're in. Um, the team that I came from before joining the transportation department was the innovation lab. And kind of the whole goal of the innovation office was to like do things differently and not go by centralized IT like policies mm -hmm. and procedures. Um, so I think I've kind of been fortunate in that way. And I, I understand that's not the situation a lot of folks are in. Um, but I think it's worth arguing for in, when you have that, that ability. Yeah, I guess I'll just add one other thing is, you know, we, we started really small um, in terms of team and in terms of projects. And I think, you know, having, getting wins, right? Showing that, you know, a little bit of coding and Googling can go a long way towards improving processes. You know, and, and getting buy-in from the people that are closest to us in the city, which are, you know, our direct managers. Yeah. Um, and kind of, you know, yeah, slowly getting more buy-in and trust there. So. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so, yeah, we kind of use this slide to, to justify the decisions we make, whether it's open source software or a vendor um, licensed product. Um, we, we, it needs to be customizable because we know that our business is unique. Um, it needs to be expandable because we know that our requirements are going to grow and change over time. It needs to be portable. Um, so I forget which speaker kind of talked about this um, yesterday, but being locked into vendors. Um, we anticipate that, um, and you know, it might, might not take five years or 10 years, but we'll probably leave some vendors behind. And at the very least, we need to be able to, to leave with our data and hopefully with some, um, some configurations or, or business rules so that we're not starting over from scratch. Um, I think it was the, the Warby Parker talk, right? Um, anyways, and the last thing is, is having support. So this could be like, you know, you're paying a vendor to um, have a help desk that they, and they give you prompt responses, or it could just be an open source community um, that maintains and, and uh, there's a lot of, like just having um, Stack Overflow questions answered already. So we're looking for, we're not trying to, to adopt cutting edge technology. We're looking for um, software choices that, that already have a built-in community of support. Um, and so, yeah, this is really the goal of a lot of what we're trying to do is have a database, some business rules, and a web form. Um, and is it really that hard in 2018, 2019 to have this kind of combination of tools? And um, it's not. There's, there's, some, there's some options out there, um, and a lot of them don't even require you to, to do much coding at all. Um, so there's a whole category of software in this space. Um, John did, did a lot of um, analysis about what, what was a good fit for us in terms of pricing. Um, and what we've been using is, is a product called NAC. Um, it has a lot of support for geospatial. Um, you can add your custom JavaScript and CSS to, for styling on top of what they provide out of the box. Um, and it integrates pretty well with other systems that, that we need and use. They have a great API that we've been leaning into a lot. And we'll show you a little bit of that when we get hands on. I mean, it's not too expensive for us. They have um, a pretty reasonable subscription level. Um, and pretty important is that we, we, don't, we aren't charged per user. Um, we're charged by the amount of data we're using. So it's more, more of like a, the cloud pricing that we're used to. Um, so yeah, this is kind of like the, the ideal state of 
of our world where we have in kind of that dotted area, a lot of stuff that's open to the public um, that, that comes that where the data come, is coming back and forth through our, our business apps or our NAC apps that our transportation staff is using to input data and to get data out of for reporting. Um, and then in the bottom right, you can't really see it as well as the public. Um, Cause it's really important for us, like John said, um, to have feedback from the public as we're developing products and prioritizing different projects. Um, but we also know that there's only so many of us inside the city that are capable of data analysis. And we, we really need to be, be able to build our systems in a way that anticipates partnerships with either the civic tech community, um, the research institutions that we're lucky to have um, in Central Texas. Um, and so that's really big, a big part of this, this model. You wanna to talk to this one? Sure. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the slide we showed in management when we um, asked them for more money. Um, you know, we these numbers are probably all a little different now, but you know, we've retired at least 16 spreadsheets that were that had mission critical data in them. Um, over 100,000 digital records, seven. I think we're up to like 200 active users now. Actually, um, we pay less than $10,000 a year for our solution, which in GovTech dollars is it's almost free, right? Um, for you know we're, we're getting like three enterprise class systems out of that and then we've also managed to integrate it with our 311 system our gis our open data portal and uh we're going to do some hands-on work around that stuff in a minute cool so we, we're going to walk through some examples of, of projects that we've done um and we'll go through this quickly because um, we have about 45 minutes left and we want to give you a lot of time to, to play around with the code too so um first is something pretty mundane purchase request the way that me and John were able to come and fly out to California to visit all y'all was by requesting flights and hotels to, through the, our department. And so it's, it's pretty nice that we have a, a recently implemented a system that makes that a little easier for both our finance team and for us requesting this type of trip. And, um, and you know, we're purchasing a lot of things like this, all of the, the, the signals and the, the signs and just there's a bunch of inventory that we need to manage and, and replenish over time. Um, so this is basically what we get out of the box with NAC. We haven't really done much to customize this um, except for put a header on top of the page. Um, and uh, yeah, we're able to see, um, you know, the people that are making requests. Um, and let me just skip to the next slide. And this is kind of the back end of what we get with NAC, kind of the GUI interface where we can build out these pages, build out these forms without needing, a, a, you know, professional software developer. Um, just someone who's savvy with technology, someone who understands database schemas can implement um, a really robust application that gets the job done. Um, and it's really, the features that we get here are really common things that we use all over the place. Um, email notifications, some kind of system of uh, a, a workflow with approval gates along the way and status changes, um, being able to just sort and filter data, export it um, from that user interface that I showed you um, at the beginning. And then one thing that's really um, helpful is our users are able to use their city of Austin email address to log into all these systems because it's pretty easy to integrate the single sign on um, and having those role based permissions. So Pam's happy. Um, another kind of uh, back end process um, that, that's really, really important to the work we do is how do we manage the work orders um, that our, te our technicians are doing out in the field and how do we uh, manage all the assets that, that exist all throughout the city in our, in our urban infrastructure. Um, so kind of coming back to the idea that we're trying to help real people um, with real problems. These are the people we're trying to help, our, our crews that are out there um, doing, doing the work. Um, so here they're um, just doing maintenance on, on lights and, and, and timing boxes. Um, so kind of going back to the slide that John showed you earlier of um, this form that they used to fill out every time that we needed to, to, um, to change a signal. And what we've been able to do is kind of update that. So now it's all that information is stored digitally with the Google map, hooray. Um, and one thing that we've been working on most recently um, <clears throat> is, so this is all on the left, you see kind of the desktop version of the NAC app. And one thing that, that NAC hasn't implemented great so far is like a really good mobile client. Um, but what we've been doing recently, what I've been kind of focusing on is building a prototype of a tablet based app um, where we're consuming the same data, we're pulling the same data out of NAC through their API and pushing in new data, um, but built in a, a completely separate client um, that, that hopefully makes it easier for them to take on the go. And so this is kind of, this is the thing that we've been 
asking for is this too much? No, we were able to, to set this up. And NAC isn't the only solution out there for this type of thing. Um, and oh yeah, um, so kind of what we've been doing here with the mobile tablet is still using, like I said, the NAC backend, but using React, which you probably heard of a JavaScript framework, to build and prototype a mobile um, a mobile view for this. I hand it back to John. Okay, uh, yeah, real quick, uh, just some more tooling that we've built. Uh, Transportation.AwesomeTexas.io is a public facing, um, what we're calling the data and performance hub, really a place where we're collecting um, some cute little dashboards for the public to consume. Really, we're, we're designing for our staff, um, for our operations folks, um, but everything happens to be publicly available. Um, and we're di we, you know, we, we keep the public in mind when we put information out there and we find that that makes information easier to digest for our staff as well. Um, so we've got this kind of slowly growing dashboarding site as we actually start to, you know, digitize information and federate our data. Um, and we're gonna be kind of dealing with one particular uh, piece of our data in the hands-on workshop, which is related to traffic signal requests. Um, so we're gonna, yeah, in a minute, I think I'll just kind of fly over this. We're gonna show you a, a little, how to make a little dashboard that will let you interact with our traffic signal request data program. Um, and these, these dashboards that you're seeing are built uh, using the API for our open data portal, which is Socrata. And the web page itself is hosted on GitHub pages and is a static site uh, using a framework called Jekyll. Just wanted to mention Docker since we had the workshop about it yesterday. We love Docker, uh, really helps kind of keep our deployments uh, nice and smooth, our environments nice and clean. And a tool that we've been leveraging a lot that hasn't been mentioned is called Postgres. Um, and Postgres is a um, really nice lightweight application that will turn your Postgres SQL database into a RESTful API. Um, it, it, you, you define all of your schema, all of your user roles and everything in Postgres SQL, just like you would, um, and Postgres spits out a REST API. And we're gonna interact with that in a minute. Uh, it's really fun to play with. Can't say enough good things about it. Um, to give you an idea, of just the data flow, you know, a lot of times we're, we're pulling data out of our NAC applications, we're pushing it into an open data portal, we're maybe logging the scripting task in our Postgres instance, and then we have our GitHub pages that's pulling data straight from our open data portal to display the information. And no transportation presentation would be complete without mentioning scooters. Um, we have spent a lot of time working uh, recently with the mobility data specification that I think y'all have probably heard of coming out of this part of the country um, that provides a, a data standard that all of the um, mobility operators it can adhere to to provide cities with a, a, a common interface for collecting scooter data for reporting purposes primarily. Uh, so Austin is requiring the mobility data specification from its scooter and bike operators and we've built some tooling around um, around this data. So we have open source, uh, we've written open source tools to process MDS data and to visualize it and uh, all good all sorts of good ETL stuff in between. Um, so you can check that out at doclist.austintexas.io. We'll get you introduced to all of that. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'm gonna kind of just jump over this because I really want you all to have a chance to get your hands dirty. Um, when you get these slides, you'll you'll find links to what we kind of call our integration toolkit. We have a, a number of repositories available uh, around ETL and data visualization. Um, and we've also written a Python client to interact with NAC applications specifically. All right. <clears throat> so, can I get a quick show of hands? What is the comfort level with Python? I know we, I think y'all were in the room yesterday. Y'all, raise your hand if you have experience writing Python code. Raise your hand if you have experience running Python, someone else's Python code. Okay. Okay, so maybe half, maybe a tiny bit more. So I, if, if you're totally comfortable with this stuff and you've used Jupyter Notebooks, just go to this URL and go crazy and let me know if you have questions. Um, otherwise, for folks who really wanna follow along, I'm just gonna step through 
every little piece of it and you should be fine. Okay. Um, so the starting point is this URL, github.com slash city of Austin slash school of data. And if you scroll down the page, you'll see part one, backend, Python ETL. And right below that, there's going to be a link that will take you to the notebook that we're going to be working out of. So the code is all hosted online, um, and you're just going to run the code out of this web interface by clicking on this link. And it might take a couple minutes to load. Feel free to raise your hand and stop me if you miss anything. Um, we'll get us all to the, the notebook that we're loading and life will be good. So, all right, great. Um, so this is a Jupyter notebook, which is a wonderful interactive way to run Python code. And to actually see our little exercise, you're going to need to click on School of Data 2019 in that little uh, folder file structure thing. Anybody lost? People with me? Yeah? All right. Um, it'll be helpful if the first thing you do is go up to the cell menu go down to all output, and then select clear. Uh, by default, this, the, the notebook shows you what the output of the code is, and it'll be a little less confusing if you just clear all that output. Great. So we're gonna do three things real quick. We're gonna extract data from a NAC application, our asset management system that we've been talking about. We're going to do a couple of little quick transforms on the data. And then we're actually going to load it into our open data portal, uh, that cool Postgres tool that I showed you uh, and talked about a minute ago. So the way that these notebooks work is um, they're broken up into cells and you can click on different parts of the page and that's a, that's a different piece of code that can run. Um, so I'm scrolling down to part one and I have put a link in here to our traffic request system. I'm going to open that in a new tab. This is just, if you want to poke around in what one of our business systems looks like, we've opened up this little test environment for you to, to take a look. And the data we're working with is related to public requests for a traffic signal or a pedestrian signal. Um, so it's got information about the location of the signal. It's got information about the... Um, uh, the type of signal, we, and then we go through a, a pretty complex scoring process to determine you know, where on our list of priorities this location might fall for installation, right? Um, so this is the system that our, our business users are using, more or less, and we're gonna take data out of it and, and open it up on our portal. So I'm gonna jump back to the notebook and keep scrolling down to our first block of code. And um, this chunk of code is going to import our Python client that is happy to interact with NAC applications. We're going to give it our application ID and password, and then we're going to ask for data. And so you can, by clicking on this cell, you can then just click the run button up at the top of the page, and it's going to run that code. And then after you run that code, you should start to see output happening right below the cell. Anybody able to extract some data from our NAC system? Awesome. Um, so you, you should have gotten 900 records. Great. And we also got some field data as well. Moving on to the next. Got some questions? OK. Um, the next cell immediately after that is just gonna print some of the data that we just downloaded. So I just clicked in the cell where it says print and then I clicked on run. And we can see nice happy 
machine readable JSON data of a traffic signal request. It has its ID, cross street, primary street, some scoring, all that good stuff. I think you got one more back there. Cool, so in this scenario, uh, suppose that, great, we got our data, but we wanna filter a little bit of it out before we post it to the public data portal. We don't wanna expose to the public, for example, the database ID that we use to track this information. Maybe we think that's sensitive or it's just not useful. Um, uh, and another issue is that all of these field names are capitalized, but the field names that we use in our open data portal need to be lowercase, right? So the, I'm on part two now where we're doing a transform. Um, we've got a couple of fun little Pythonic um, list comprehensions that are gonna iterate over all the values in the data set and they're gonna lower the column names or the keys. And when I run that, it's also gonna print out the results. And just like that, we have now lowercase column names in the JSON instead of uppercase, right? Does yeah. It does not. Uh, so we're just, we're pulling out uh, lists of diction, Python dictionaries, um, which you could easily feed into pandas. Yep. <clears throat> um, your next transforms, transform step is in the cell that starts with exclude keys. And so I've just listed some field names here that I don't want in the data anymore when I publish it publicly. Um, so I'll run this code and print it. And if you are astute, you will notice that there is no longer an ID field or a landmark field in my record. Isn't that an interesting, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's an interesting point um, that was somewhat lost over with that question, which is that uh, does Mac return like a pandas data frame? And sometimes when you're working in like a pi data stack of like Jupyter notebooks, um, there's actually going down to the data type level a fundamental difference between stuff that's numpy, scipy, pandas, and just plain old Python dictionary lists, enums. Mm. Um, and it's a little weird because you're still typing in the same language and typing in the same, you know, Word, you know, words, but they behave differently. And actually, the way they represent, like, say, integers, is like different at a bit level. This is like ninety nine point nine percent not a problem most of the time. But then there's mm. that point one percent time you end up like uh, doing something differently. So it's very useful to think: Do uh, um, when you start a notebook or project, like, do I need pandas or not to do the transformations? Okay. And like. Python is still actually plenty powerful a lot of the time, but you don't, you really, in, like my personal philosophy, but this is a personal philosophy, is only when you need to compute statistics do you need to pull in the whole scientific mm. Python universe, like, in, yeah. or you want to take advantage of some of their loaders and, like, Pandas makes it very easy to, like, load a CSV from Socrata, because you can literally just copy and paste the CSV URL and it's in the frame instantaneously. Right. But sometimes, especially when you're dealing with, like, other APIs that are not, you know, tabular data, it's often easier to stay in the pure Python universe, but it's really like you've almost got two languages existing in the same place. Mm. That's like a digression, but I think that's yeah. kind of expanding on philosophical choice. Yeah, definitely for, for my toolkit, I mean, doing ETL work, like I just, I want to put as few things between the two systems as possible in terms of just like packages and, and, and libraries. Um, so the more that I kind of understand the way the data is being changed, the more comfortable I feel about how things are kind of working, right? Um, so pandas for me is great if I want to like quickly look at the data and actually just kind of see what it looks like, maybe do some basic analysis. But yeah, when I'm when I'm writing an ETL tool, I, I, I tend to stay away. Yeah. Uh, Awesome. So there's a pretty easy method then to accomplish that. Okay, so we're, we're almost done with this backend ETL. The next step, uh, we've got our data transformed. We're gonna uh, send it up to our open data portal. We're gonna load it. Uh, so this last code block in your notebook 
is importing another client that interacts specifically with Postgres. We're giving it the REST API endpoint, an authorization token. Then we will kind of create a new instance of our client, and then we're just going to pass it our new filtered data, and it's going to post it to the database. Um, we're actually performing, you might notice, um, we're performing what's called an upsert. So any record that already exists has, you know, if that primary key already exists in the destination database, we're just going to update that record. If we don't find that primary key in the database, we're going to create a new record. Um, so upsert is everyone's best friend. Is the JSON schema set by the It is, yep. So there's not that I know of, right. So like if I wanted to create a new view that I can access from my API, I'd log into my database, just write a create view statement in SQL, restart my Postgres server, and I have an API for that view. It's very fun. Yeah, it's black magic. Mateo? I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm okay. sure there's a equivalent things for like the NoSQL world. Yeah. But I just don't know what it would be. Yeah, super fun. Um, great. And so if very at the very last step, um, I have a URL to the actual um, Postgres endpoint here. So this is schoolofdata.austintexas.io slash signal requests. And this is just giving, just showing you that signal request data that's being served up on the public internet. Um, and then, of course, there, you know, it is an API, and you can read the API docs and do all sorts of, um, you know, querying, filtering requests, whatever, to get data. All right. Any questions before we switch over to the front end? Is that fun? Yeah. Not cool. Awesome. That's great. We're really happy to hear that. So the other cool thing that Austin does is like I stock their stuff on GitHub, and like I highly recommend checking out like just being able to like go and look at other shit. Like when there isn't school and when there's so much out there, please stop sharing your screen. And you can talk to us. We like yeah. to talk. So <laughs> feel free to reach out. Cool. So that was the back end side. Um, and uh, whenever Hunter invited us to talk, it was originally about databases and, and BI. And to be honest with you, we're not doing a lot of, we haven't picked a BI platform to, to, to use yet. We really kind of are scratching the surface of getting data that was in paper into databases, um, kind of fielding one-off requests to build out dashboards. So we're doing a lot of that by hand with JavaScript. Um, and we're kind of just starting to scratch the surface of like, okay, there's enough, now that we have uh, a universe of data and our, our staff knows how, um, or ha has curiosities around that data, maybe we'll start doing more investigation about do we want to use a platform like Tableau or, or something else. Um, but we really haven't made that investment yet because it is a, it seems like it's a big investment. <laughs> um, so um, what I was going to show off today is just how we go about pulling the data that, that John just uploaded and making some simple JavaScript interactive tools with that. And usually, for me, that like what we're really trying to do with business intelligence is tell stories with the data. Um, and so that's what we're going to work on now. So um, the way I'm going to try to do this, um, so underneath John's section, there's the part two front end um, JavaScript data viz. Um, and so if you go to that repo, um, school of data and you're in the master branch 
Um, you want to go ahead and CD into the front end. You hopefully you've already in, installed or done the npm install, and I'll pull down all the dependencies that we're going to use. Um, and you can actually go ahead and run like npm. Actually, before I do that, um, I had a bun bunch of commits that I did along the way with Git. Um, and I picked some of the, the kind of key milestones within the process of, of putting this work together. Those are called tags. So if you go to git tag, you can kind of see the list of steps that we're going to go through. Um, and so I'm going to be jumping around and checking out different points in time just to kind of um, quickly go through what we did. Um, so the first thing I'll do is um, kind of show you what we are going to be working towards, um, which is this React app, which has a table on the left side and a map on the right side. Um, and it's just pulling that same data out that, that John just uploaded. Um, so let's go back to the beginning and see how we got here. So if I go to Git, check out, and I have a shortcut. I normally just say CO, but you might need to spell out check out and step one. And that will take us to the commit um, where this all got started. And if I'm already, I'm, I'm already running, let me, I skipped a step for you all that you will need to do, which is run npm start. Um, and that just sets up the development server. Um, it's going to take a second to load up. And then as we make changes, it's going to automatically be reflected in the browser. Um, so that, at this point in time, we've, we've just kind of downloaded Create React App, um, which is just boilerplate and a good starting plate, place for a lot of JavaScript, um, or for a lot of React-specific JavaScript. Um, and I'll open up the code, too, so you can see where, what our code looks like. Um, the, the kind of within this front end directory, um, this, the kind of meat of what we're going to be looking at is going to be in this package.json um, and in this source directory. We're really mainly going to only be looking at this app.js file. And this is all that just came, you know, for free whenever we downloaded Create React App. Okay, so let's go to the next step. Um, I'm going to get checkout step two. And now, if we go to the code, what I've added is this block of code, um, which is using a library called Axios, um, which is basically just pulling, that's still pretty small for y'all, um, just pulling data from an API. Um, we give it some endpoint URL. Um, and once it gets it, it console logs it to the bottom of, into our console, and it updates the React state. So um, I'm not going to go too, too deep into, into React. Hopefully, this sparks some curiosity for you, um, and you may, might be interested. But a, a key concept in React is this idea of state. And so you're able to update the state of your application. Um, and in this case, it's really around the, the object of data that we're pulling down from the server. Um, so once we get the data, um, from the server, we update our state with the set state method, which is just a React tool, and we we have now um, we have we now have data. If there's any errors, we console log them, and then another part of React is this lifecycle method called, called component will mount. So once everything's about to run to the page, this command gets executed. Our get data from endpoint. Um, we're actually using our open data endpoint, Socrata endpoint. Um, that was, we could be using um, the same endpoint that John just set up. We just had issues getting the cert set up, and we wanted to eat tacos and go to the bar last night instead of getting SSL set up. So um, this, this isn't, we're not exactly pulling the exact same data that we just uploaded using um, John's kind of backend process, but it, it, it is the same data. Um, and so, yeah, this is, all our code is right now is these two methods, um, getting the data whenever the component's about to load to the page, actually executing that method. And now we have this.state.data, which once it has kind of loaded the data, it will just um, render it to the screen. So if I go to the web page, now we have, we have our data just getting spit out onto the page. So in addition to being in the console here at the bottom, it's also um, on, the, on the page there. So um, we're going to step forward to adding the table. Um, so I'm using a library called Material Table. I was just Googling around yesterday, or the day before yesterday, and this one was kind of the easiest to get going with. Um, and it has a lot of kind of built-in features we'll, we'll look at. Um, so just looking at the code again, we've added um, 
this idea of kind of a Boolean of whether the data has been loaded yet. So, and this is just gonna give us kind of a flip or like a switch um, so that we're not gonna display anything until the data has been loaded. Otherwise we're gonna have like an empty weird looking table. Another um, just kind of side note, uh, the material library uses these icons which are like a font family. So we're importing those icons down with CSS. That CSS gets loaded right here. Um, and so once we pull in this material table component, this is all the same, line 16 through 29 through 35. And now what we're doing is creating a columns, like an array, um, that's really just sets up what our, our headers are gonna be um, in this table. And we use this material component, we give it a title, we pass in those columns and we pass in the data. Um, so it's a pretty simple thing out of the box and what it gives us is if we go to, oops, we go to the rendered page. We already have we have our data here. We have that title, um, and we can do things like filter on by type or, or sort, I should say, um, or we could search. So I live close to a big intersect or a big uh, corridor called Cameron Road, and so these are some of the pedestrian hybrid beacons and traffic signals that have been requested relatively near my my house, um, and we can see the request status. So we could look at just the ones that are under study. Um, we could look at more rows. We could page through all the way to the end, maybe. Uh, close to the end, yeah. Um, so that gives you kind of an idea of what we get without having to like write any special, like this is a pretty complex um, JavaScript little tool here, but we're able just to download that open source package, throw in some data, give it a title, define our column headers, and voila, we have something that um, could be useful for staff to, to, to search through and sort through and yeah, please. So I'm, I'm more of a front-end developer, um, and that's kind of why I, I go to the JavaScript stuff first. I don't know, John, do you have opinions about um, Python for visualizations? No, really, I have to use it a whole lot. Um, they look nice. Um, but Mm. Uh, I haven't used that. It's just like a quick dashboard and then it's like that. Yeah, it's Python and React. Oh, really? Cool. It's obviously not a web tool, pure React. Right. Cool. cool. I'll have to look into that. Um, okay, so I think we're short on time. What time do we end? 10, 10, oh, 45. Oh, we're good on time. Oh, I'll slow down. <laughs> yeah, plenty of time. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought we had like 10 minutes left. Okay, so I'm gonna step forward to the next part. And this is where the map, the mapping stuff is always the most fun for me at least. Um, and so if we go to step, there's actually a couple. So if I go to git tag, let me clear, make this a little bigger, git tag. So we have three different steps within step four. So let's go to um, git check out step 4.1. <clears throat> okay, so we were looking at the material table. Now let's add a leaflet based map to the page. Um, so that's, you already see it there. Let me go to the code first. <clears throat> okay, so there's a couple things that happen here with leaflet and and React that are, that are a little, yeah, you have a question? Uh, 4.1, step 4.1, all one word. Um, so the first thing we need to do is import some of the leaflet components we're gonna be using. Um, there's also this, there's this kind of like, I don't wanna call it a bug, but this issue with leaflet and React where your tiles will render kind of weird unless you override some of the icon defaults. Um, and I only found this by like looking through someone's comments. Um, so basically, I created this override leaflet icons function um, that does things that people on the internet said you're supposed to do to fix the problem I had. And then I import it and execute it right away. And um, that solves any problems we have rendering our tiles. Um, and the only new parts here are really starting around line 47. We are picking kind of the center of our map, so that's the center of Austin. Uh, our zoom level, so how closely we wanna zoom in and out. 
Um, and then we need to give our, um, the map itself, the, the kind of bounding box or the, the div that it's gonna be inside, we need to give it a, a size, otherwise it's gonna just, you're not gonna be able to see it because it's gonna be, not gonna have a height. Um, so we're gonna give it a height of the size of the, the height of the screen or the height of our viewport. Um, and I also imported um, Bootstrap um, here and the Leaflet CSS and our app CSS. Um, I've been using re uh, Bootstrap for a long time. It's kind of overkill, um, but it gives us um, a way to kind of have this flexible grid. Um, so everything is inside of a row. And then the um, table is going to be in a column on the left. Or, yeah, your left. <laughs> and the map is going to be a, in a column on the right. And so that's what this row and column um, kind of shortcuts are doing for us. Um, and then here's the map itself. Um, the map is the parent component. We put in our, the center, that array, the lat long, that's the center of Austin, the zoom, and that kind of map styling that I mentioned. We give it a tile layer. Um, here it could be an Esri tile. It could be, um, it could be a Google tile, I guess. Yeah, there might be technical reasons or legal reasons why you wouldn't use a Google map here. Um, but <laughs> So forget I said that, um, but there's a lot of like OpenStreetMap, there's a lot of free tiles out there too. And so we're using one called Stammon. Um, and then just to like test this out, we're dropping a marker in the center of our map. We're giving it a pop-up with just like a, a basic, you know, text in the middle. Um, and that's basically all we needed to do to create this map on the right side. Does that make sense so far? I know I'm just going kind of quick, but. Okay, so, um, but what we wanna do is not just manually drop um, one marker. We wanna see a representation for all of these, all of like what we're seeing in the table, all of these, these, um, these traffic uh, signal requests and pedestrian beacons that could be installed or have been installed. We wanna see where those are on the map. And so this is where it gets like kind of a little more advanced JavaScript, um, but not too much. So we're going to check out step 4.2. And you see what happened there. Let's see the code that did it. OK. So remember how in React we have this really cool concept of state. Um, at the beginning, whenever the, the, the component is initialized, our data is just an empty object. And we set the data to loaded as false to start off. Once we go and get the data, we populate the data that we got into state and we flip that Boolean to true because now the data is loaded. Um, so that's just kind of reviewing how we got to here. So once we're in, um, once we have that data back from, in this case, Socrata, um, I'm gonna just show you kind of what the data looks like. Um, it's in here, it's an array of a bunch of items and each item is like a key value pair um, and like, you know, an object looking thing. So, and I guess the other thing to show you here, kind of like what John showed earlier is um, all these different fields that we're using, the ones that are gonna be important for mapping are those lat and long, obviously. Um, and so we use this method um, called map, which basically just as a for loop, it just goes over every single item in our array um, and for every item in our array, we're going to create, instead of using that, the marker, we're going to use like a circle marker. And that's what you saw, those little blue dots. Um, and item is going to be kind of our reference to the current, um, you know, whenever we're going through this long array of a thousand records, item is the record that we're currently looking at, just like in a for loop. And so we, for each item, we get its latitude and its longitude. We give it a radius and we have this circle that plots onto the map. And then we're, and we're, gonna, we're gonna update our pop-up so that we have some information that's specific to each, each little dot, each little signal request or, or what have you. Um, so the eval type, so what type of request is it, the name of the, the intersection or the location, and then what status it's in. And that's all we've really changed. Um, but this kind of dot map is the special sauce that gets used all over the place in React programming that lets you take an array and do a bunch of things on it. So having this kind of one um, component do the same thing over and over and over again. And so that's what we have. 
in the, in the right now. Um, and so if I click on one of these little dots, we see this is a pedestrian beacon, where the location and um, the status it's in. Same kind of information we're seeing in the table. Cool. Any questions? Step through to the next one, get check out step 4.3. And all we're gonna do here is just do some styling um, on the markers. Um, as you see here, we wanna be able to visually see um, the different, like there's those two main types, the traffic signals, the pedestrian beacons, let's see them in different colors. And so how do we do that with our code? Um, main change here is this little object called circle marker, sorry, circle marker style. So we have PHB. So whenever we have a PHB as our type, we want to give it this styling, this color, these colors, um, this opacity. And whenever we have a traffic type, then we do, we do that. And so the way we reference this as we're, when we're inside of our, um, our circle here, um, is, is basically we look at that object and for the item that we're on, we look at its eval type. Um, if it's PHB, then it's going to be referencing whenever we look at color, this color. And so that's how, or fill color, and that's how we get for each of, for the color, the fill color, the, the weight and the opacity, we kind of use this object as a reference to pull out those values. So it's kind of a way to have like a little bit of a configuration um, for, for your items as they go through. And that's all we changed. And that, that kind of simple change gave us um, a pretty, pretty interesting and helpful map to kind of see um, where these different requests are, are happening. Uh, maybe we should make that radius smaller. That's, it looks, looks kind of weird when you zoom in. So we can just change this radius right here and the page reloads and yeah. Maybe there's a couple more. Yeah, I do. <laughs> there's a way. Cool. Um, so there's one last step. Um, before we get to the last step, um, what, what I would do next if I had more time and, and if this is kind of like extra credit, if you are interested in playing, this, playing with this more and you want to get your hands dirty with React, um, what would be really fun to do is to be able to click on a row here um, and then have that zoom in on a specific dot. Um, and if you go to the material table, React component, oh wait, that's not it. I think it's this one. Yeah. So if you looked into their docs, you would see um, they have what are called props. So props and state are the two really important things to know about and react as a beginner. And they have these methods so that um, on row click, there's a function that we could use to do something else. And so that's kind of the clue I would give um, if you wanted to, to, to dig a little deeper and, and play with this. Um, you could basically trigger actions to happen built in with a library. They kind of give you a hook or, or uh, a way to jump in and, and do something there. Um, and you just, you find that out by reading through their, their, their documentation, which is pretty nice. Um, but that's kind of what I would suggest for extra credit um, or what I'll, and if anyone wants to do that and create a pull request and give that code back, I would, that would be cool. <laughs> um, but um, the, the, the thing that's really important for us is being able to get this out in the wild and get feedback. Like, like we talked about, we have sprint reviews and it's really important for us to ship things um, so we know whether it's useful or not. Um, and so what's really nice, um, without having to like provision servers or do much else, um, since everything we're doing in here is open data, and even whether it's useful to the public or not, it's useful to our staff. And by using um, GitHub and GitHub pages, um, we can get this served pretty quickly. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna show you next. And so there's a handy library called, um, called GH Pages. It's an NPM package called GH Pages. Um, and so if I get check out, I'll spell it out, check out step five. Oops, I made changes because I changed the radius there. So I'm gonna just stash those changes and forget about them and check out step five. Okay, so now I was able to get to step five. We added this GH pages package 
And this is, I, at the beginning, I said we we're going to mess around with the package.json. So kind of in the same way with Python, you have your requirements.txt file. That's kind of what the package.json file is doing, basically. It lists out your dependencies. So these are all the dependencies we, we've used. We installed Axios boot to, to get data from the API. Um, Bootstrap gave us some styling um, shortcuts. Leaflet is a dependency of React leaflet. That's what gives us our map. Material table is what we're doing for the table. And then all the React stuff um, is kind of what comes out of the box with Create React App. But what we need to add are these two lines within our scripts. Um, so whenever we type in npm start, that's what starts our development server. Um, and we can create a pre-deploy script and a deploy script, which to be honest with you is just, this pre-deploy script is just running this build script. Um, and this deploy script is kind of doing the special stuff. But, um, and then we also need to tell, this is a really important part, wherever we're gonna send this, um, wherever we want this to be hosted, um, whatever GitHub repo that it's gonna live at, we need to have our organization name. So if this was your individual account. Um, for me, it'd be like mateoclark.github.io and then the name of the repo. Um, and this is really important and that's, where, that's how GitHub knows where to send the deployed code to. Um, and so if we go to, in our command line, we type in npm run pre-deploy. This creates a, a build, kind of an optimized build of the JavaScript code that we had, spits out some HTML, some CSS, and obviously JavaScript. It turns like all this React stuff we're doing is kind of like modern JavaScript that doesn't necessarily work on all browsers. So what this is doing is kind of um, compiling it down so it works on browsers, no problem. Down to like IE 10. <laughs> um, and so it, you can see that it spit these files out. And then the next step would just be to npm run deploy. And it's interesting, it's actually creating the, the builds here too. So I'm wondering if we even needed that pre-deploy step. Could, we could trial and error with that. Um, but I just followed their documentation and said to do both, so. Um, so now if we go to GitHub, we, everything um, we've been doing so far has basically been on the master, bra master branch. Um, but what GH Pages does, GitHub Pages, it creates a, a separate branch called GH Pages branch and we go here, well, so let me, let me just back up. So you can see all of the code that we've, that me and John have been working through, the Python notebook and the front end directory are all inside of um, this kind of master branch. But what's gonna end up on the GH pages branch is, is different. It's gonna be basically the first thing that's gonna be executed or when it gets to the browser is this index.html. And that's gonna be kind of this minified HTML file. And that HTML file is what's gonna reference all of our static assets that we just built, the CSS and the JavaScript. And so you can kind of see in here the different kind of, and I, I don't even know the difference between each of these. I think they're kind of progressive um, enhancement or um, the you know, different uh, versions of our, of our JavaScript bundle um, for troubleshooting and um, yeah, anyways. All you need to know here is that um, we have two really important branches. One is the master branch where we're committing a lot of the code to. And the other one is the GH pages branch is basically like our deploy branch. Um, and whenever, yeah, whenever we go to, I think I have the link here. Whenever we go to this link, cityofaustin.github.io slash school of data, we see our end product. And as we make changes, we could redeploy and update what's here. And that's all I wanted to show y'all. Um, and I, uh, kind of had step-by-step -step instructions here. Along the way, I, um, as I was building this out, I installed different packages. By doing npm install at the very beginning, you kind of got all of those because they had already been added um, to package.json, but you can kind of step through here um, and, and see the decisions I had to make along the way. I think that's all. Let's see, do we have a closing slide? I don't think we do. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were worried about not finishing. <laughs> and I have 10 minutes to spare, so.
I guess, um, yeah, if you can either like let y'all go. Um, yeah, uh, so the city itself is what, 800,000? I think the metro area is like 1.1 million right now, but it's growing quickly. And it's growing quicker in the metro area than in the, the city itself, which has its own problematic issues. But yeah. The vegan food Yeah. Exactly. Do you have well, hopefully, yeah. And with and when they don't work, we we. Oh really? I don't know about that. No, our, ours. Ours, we want them to work. And part of the reason we try to automate all of like the asset management is so whenever there is one that's not working and someone calls through and one and says, hey, this pedestrian beacon didn't work, we can go track it down they, and update it. Assume they always, they, they eliminated that. Yeah. The question yeah. was about if our, if our pedestrian signal buttons actually trigger the walk sign. Right. In, the, in a, lot of, a lot of cities, Austin included, in the downtown area, the ped signals are just what they call in recall. So every time yeah, recall, right. it's showing up. Show up. Um, but in the yeah, in the less uh, in the parts of town where there's less ped traffic, the buttons do actually extend okay. the traffic signal time to let you cross. Yeah. So push the button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like John, you should answer this question. <laughs> well, yeah. So for the recording, the question was, how do you hire people to do non-sexy work that's really important when maybe they want to come in and build fun React apps? I mean, we somehow got Mateo to join the team. Um, <laughs> and I have fun. <laughs> you have fun. Yeah. I, um, I think you do have to you know, make sure that your staff are getting to work on projects that are enjoyable to them, too. So it's probably a balance. Um, and there are people out there like me who really actually enjoy replacing paper with a business system and don't need a front end app. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, I, it's tough. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, especially working in the public sector and in the nonprofit space, the reason people choose this line of work is because they want to help people. And so, if you can articulate the way that you can help people have a big impact is by doing the more mundane back office stuff. Um, and eat your vegetables like that. I think, I think people join this line of work because they, they get that. Mm -hmm. um, I think when it comes to retaining people or just like, you know, making people have some autonomy or um, just like really scratch the curiosity itch that a lot of us have as technologists, um, just every now and then looking for opportunities to show off something that's a little more flashy, um, whether it's really pushing the bigger impact or not. Like that's kind of how this whole dockless scooter was for us. I mean, it's, it's really relevant, it's important, um, but at the end of the day, it's kind of a distraction from what we're trying to do, but we try to make the most of it, build some tools um, that were fun to build, that are cool to show off. And then we had that fun time and now it's like back to normal business. Um, so I think it's kind of like John said, it's a balance. And I think a lot of it's about the culture you're able to like establish in your team. Um, just getting people to, to buy into what's important, but also recognizing that, yeah, like people have a lot of other options in terms of what they do with their time. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at when recruiting is hard. Um, but I think, you know, the people that land in this, this type of work are, they're up for yeah. the more mundane stuff. I, I would also just add that I think it's, I mean, it is important to make shiny things for the people who care about shiny things, right? So, um, you know, for every like back office, magic that we worked that no one really sees at the executive level, it's good to have a dashboard that pairs with it. Yeah. 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 And uh, just one more thing, uh, kind of getting back to the idea of having these iterative cycles and doing research with users. Um, if you know who you're helping, like if, if, if those uh, developers or business intelligence people or, you know, data engineers or whatever they are, um, have a personal relationship with the person that they're helping out with a more mundane process, then maybe they'll be a little more interested or vested in. So don't hesitate to bring in developers um, or, or whoever into some of those meetings to, to understand the problems because um, a, a way a lot of folks work is like once they see a problem, they wanna solve it, right? Um, and so if they're able to actually see that it's a problem and not just something that's kind of being pushed from the top down, then, then maybe that will motivate them a little more um, to have that kind of human, human connection and really solve a problem that someone's having. Of course, great question.
Any other questions? All right, well, thanks so much for having us. It's really been an, an honor to, to come out to this beautiful city and spend some time with you all, learn from all the other great presentations so far. So thanks for having us, it's been really cool. Yeah, thanks a lot.